Yeah. So it basically refers to a set of dietary nutritional interventions along with supplements in order to act at the cellular level or the physiological level so that we can work on the core features of spectrum or on the autism. Here we are not dealing with to treat something because we know that autism is not a treatable. Here we are basically working at the level to modify the functions or the physiological or the cellular functions of the body so that we can bring the child as close as possible to a neurotypical child. Okay, so this is the main purpose of going into the biomedical interventions in autism and dealing with how to uh, doing with biomedical. So when we talk about autism, now I won't be going into this presentation it will be strictly in terms related to the biomed and it's a very vast topic. So we'll be touching upon the superficial aspects and then if you have any queries, we can discuss with that. And uh, I have shared you a video on the group also and i hope uh, the parents must have gone through because it will become easier for you and for me to discuss about that methylation cycle because that has been uh, discussed in detail but here in the presentation we won't be going to the details so the purpose was there so that you can understand the detailing of those uh, cycles so coming to the autism now we know that this is a spectrum so nothing is clear cut or nothing is there that, okay, this is only the sole feature or this is the main. There are so many things which are happening in the spectrum. So we have to look on all these aspects. So coming to this spectrum of autism, we know that leaky gut is an issue. Remember, I'm talking here in terms related to the biomed aspects only. So I won't be touching about the sensory, the communication and other things. So autism, we know that leaky gut is an issue. We know that there are methylation cell defects. We know that there are behavioral issues. We know that there are children on the spectrum, they are picky eaters. Now, because of this picky eating behaviors, we know that they are very fussy eaters. There may be a lot of nutritional deficiencies. They may be choosy to one thing. They may be uh, wanting one thing or the other continuously. So as a result, we can say the balanced diet is not going. So nutritional deficiencies is a big issue. Gut dysbiosis. Now, gut dysbiosis is another a big, big problem because we know that Gut issues are the major sources or the major culprit and they are present in more than 25% of the kids who are in the spectrum. And the severity of the gut, no doubt, worsens the severity of our behavioral issues or the higher function. Our thoughts, our thinking, our ability, our sensory issues because of the gut-brain axis. Now, gut-brain axis is another a different topic. So I won't be going to that. But yes, gut dysbiosis is a big problem in children who are on the spectrum. Mitochondrial dysfunction. Now, mitochondrial disorder is something different and mitochondrial dysfunction is something different. Here, the children who are on the spectrum, it is not the mitochondrial disorder. These are mitochondrial dysfunction. Now, mitochondria is like our engine of a body. Now, mitochondria is like an engine of a body which is responsible for carrying out more than 200 or majority of the functions of the cells in our body. It can, be pro it can be production of proteins, it can be carbohydrate breakdown, it can be formation of new cells, it can be aging, it can be different, different things, detoxification. So all these functions are carried out by mitochondria. Now, because this mitochondria is affected, so as a result, the majority of the cells which are, are responsible for carrying out various functions in our body gets affected. So as a result of which, because of this curious mitochondrial dysfunction, it is believed that our learning, our judgment, our ability, our speech, our high mental functions, our ability to thought, our senses, our aggression, our gut, all these things are related. So as a result, if there is a mitochondrial dysfunction, then yes, the ability of high mental functions, the ability of judgment, the behavioral and other factors, detoxification cells are also affected. And it is believed around 40 to 80% of the kids who are on the spectrum, they have this mitochondrial dysfunction. Now, this range of uh, percentage is so high that it is 40 to 80 percent. So wide is the range. So again, as I was saying, the spectrum is so wide. Similarly, the associated features also are so wide. We cannot detect that this child is having severe mitochondrial dysfunction. This child is having mild mitochondrial dysfunction. But yes, we will be able to figure out, sorry, through some of the clinical pictures, which can give you an idea that yes, 
this child might be having a severe form of mitochondrial dysfunction. But nevertheless saying that every child who is on the spectrum will definitely have a mitochondrial dysfunction. Leaky gut, leaky gut we know that it's a big problem because of this leaky gut syndrome. Uh, there is a problem with gluten in casein and as a result of which breakdown products are released, they leak to the brain and there they cause all those manifestations. Omega-3 is a rule because of the deficiency of omega-3, leaky gut can be worsened. It can be worsened because of various other factors like antibiotics and even irrational use of uh, junk food or gut microbiota which is disturbed, the delivery mode. There are so many things which can affect. So we'll be coming to the details of each of these factors which I have mentioned. So this is the basically the, uh, the slide in which we'll be discussing on all these parameters. So taking into consideration all these parameters, we'll be uh, working on the biomed plan. So our aim of biomed plan is to target on all these features. If we are able to work on all these features, we say that yes, probably we will be working for the benefit of the child and we might get some beneficial and some success in improving the features or the core features of children who are on the spectrum. And because of this, we cannot say that a biomedical plan can be generalized or it can be given like a treatment for typhoid. If two bachche ko typhoid hai, we can prescribe the medication. Same child can take the medication. But this is not possible in a child who is on the spectrum. If a child is following one biomed plan, it is not possible that the same biomed plan will be given to this, uh, will be given to the other child. Though the approach will be same, but in what intensity, in how much duration, that varies individualistically from child to child depending upon these features which I have described around the spectrum in every kid. We know that if we meet one child on a spectrum, we will meet another child on the spectrum because no two children on spectrum are similar. So the term biomed, as I have told you, the purpose is to act at the biological level so that we can able to improve the biological processes of the individual child rather than treating the medical problems. If we are able to resolve those biological issues at the cellular level, we may able to resolve some of the features and be able to get better results. And research has shown that neurodevelopmental disorders, especially the spectrum, they have been associated, genetic associations are there, metabolic dysfunctions are there, nutritional deficiencies, immune dysfunctions, GI disorders mean gastrointestinal and sleep disorders. Now, keeping aside the genetic disorders, Metabolic dysfunctions, nutritional deficiencies, immune dysfunctions, GI and sleep disorders, they can be targeted through the biomed plan. But genetic disorders, we can't target that. Definitely, it's a genetic problem. It is a genetic, that is the makeup of the genes is different. The purpose of going to genetic disorders is that if one child is on the spectrum, is associated with some genetic disorder. Most common ones, they are like Down syndrome or it may be a, a, a fragile X syndrome. So there are some syndromes which are there, which are associated. So if a child is diagnosed with genetic, we can go for a genetic counseling so that the risk of going for a second child, if we plan for a second child, the genetic association in that child, we can able to identify that during the period of conceive or during the period of pregnancy through amniocentesis and various other fetal nuclear medicines and etc. So biomedical approach. So this is the biomedical approach when we target. We have to look into the gut issues. Always remember, just keep this, uh, take a snapshot of this chart. Take a snapshot of this slide because all this treat, all this approach of biomedical will be around all these parameters. So it will not be possible for me to go back again onto this slide. So you can take this snapshot because we'll be discussing around this. So the GI, that is the gastrointestinal issues. We know that gut is a very big problem. And because of gut dysbiosis, we get a lot of issues. Methylation cycle. Methylation cycle is a big problem. So what is the role of these methyl B12 or MBD12? We uh, hear a lot about B12. What is exactly how we can work it at all? Nutritional support, as I've told. Now, fungus, yeast overgrowth issues is again a big problem, which we have to work in accordance with the biomet plan to rule out, are these things disturbing the gut? Are they are disturbing the, uh, uh, I mean, the ratio between the good and the bad bacteria? Is the bad bacteria is increasing number or the ratio is disturbed or not? Because normally uh, what happens in the gut, there is always a ratio between the good and the bad bacteria. There is always a ratio, there is always a balance between the good and the bad bacteria. When this 
back when this ratio gets disturbed what we call as gut dysbiosis means the bad bacteria increase in number the good bacteria go in number so as a result the whole uh, cycle or the whole vicious cycle of toxins starts eliminate uh, start releasing from the gut and reaches the brain through the gut brain axis what we call as the gut brain axis and it is very well now proved in research and literature that gut plays a very important role in modifying your mood in modifying your behaviors in modifying your emotions so whether it is a spectrum whether it is a schizophrenic whether it is a mood whether it is a bipolar disorder whether it is an adhd the gut microbiota plays a very important role in modifying your uh, functions of thoughts and behaviors immune system immune system is a big problem again we see that children who are on the spectrum they have lot of immune, uh, immune disturbances in the form unki immunity bahut kam hoti hai frequently cough and cold ho jata hai frequently diarrhea ho jata hai adenoids ki problem hoti hai uh, tonsils ki problem hoti hai seasonal cough and cold hota hai recurrent pneumonias hote hain compare agar hum kare ek neurotypical child to a neurodiverse child the percentage of hospitalization and the percentage of injectables and antibiotics is around 20 to 25% more than compared to a neurotypical child why is that it is not that the autism is the culprit the culprit is the immune dysregulation or the weakened immune system which happens because of the part of the spectrum and which happens because of the disturbances in all these surrounding parameters of gut microbiota gi fungus oxidative stress and etc etc so then we have the oxidative stress now oxidative stress as we have told that detoxification is a very natural mechanism which happens by the mitochondria to in our body when we work throughout our body uh, just imagine and take this example in your kids when we are working throughout the day we get so exhausted either we may get exhausted mentally we may get exhausted physically then we go for a sleep of 2 to 3 hours and after getting up we feel relaxed now what is that period of why we feel relaxed why we are comfortable and we are able to think a new thought with a new bright ideas and we are not frustrated we are not irritated with a fresh mind the reason is because during that period of sleep or during that period of relaxation detoxification happens in our body because of that detoxification the free radicals which are produced during your stress whether it may be a mental whether it may be a physical stress that happens smoothly and those detoxified materials which are produced in our body during our stress or even by the natural mechanisms of our body by the liver by the etc because liver also acts as a strong detoxifier along with these mitochondria if the mitochondria is smooth it will help in functioning all the detoxifying bodies of the cells all the detoxifying cells of the body if the mitochondria is an engine and mitochondria will hold the rest of the cells of a body there are millions and millions of cells in the body which are carrying out the individual functions of detoxification so this mitochondria will help in carrying out so if the mitochondria is affected the detoxification will be hampered so we feel relaxed because we are going into a smooth phase of detoxification now imagine a child who is on the spectrum he will be running here and there throughout the day he will be shouting he will be screaming he will be jumping here and there no doubt although he is not doing much constructive activity but yes he is he is tired he is uh, you know he is tired and he is physically exhausted or he may be mentally exhausted because of those reasons we say that we have seen the children who go for a therapy sessions for 3 to 4 hours in a day after coming home they will be go suddenly in a sensory meltdown because the exhaust their body is not able to exhaust that much stress which has been given to their body so as a result they may go into a sensory meltdown it's not that every child will go but depending upon the severity so as a result what happens when they go for a sleep say suppose a child who is uh, running here and there throughout the day he goes for a sleep and he takes a nice sleep for 7 to 8 hours and then in the morning again he is with the same agitation aggression frustration running here and there now he has taken a sound sleep he is calm then why is that happening that again in the morning with the same agitation with the same aggression he is carrying out the day this is because that detoxification is not happen in that kid which it used to have or which it should supposed to happen in the neurotypical child now it is not happening in that kid it is not happening in those kids because the mitochondria is not functioning smoothly now depending upon that severity as i have told you the ratio is 20 to 40% some kids might get up in the morning comfortably but by the day they will start showing aggression they will be frustrated some of the kids in the morning only without any reason they may start aggressing they may start throwing and the mothers will be worried what exactly happened i don't know is there is a gut issue is there is so much problem definitely there will be severities now those severities can give us an indication 
how severe the mitochondria is. This is what some clinical judgment and some practical approaches to which we can judge our child. Yes, he requires something which is disturbing his mitochondrial dysfunction. So this is one. Neuroinflammation. Now, neuroinflammation in a simple word means swelling of the brain. Now, swelling of the brain means it's just like uh, uh, the toxins which are released from the uh, gut, they reach the brain. And when they reach the brain, they cause the inflammation in the brains. Inflammation means swelling. Now, because of that inflammation and swelling in the brain, there will be agitation, there will be frustration, or I would say it will disturb the functioning of amygdala, uh, thalamus, hypo, uh, hippocampus, and I would say cingulate virus. Now, uh, forget about all these things. Just remember amygdala. Now, amygdala is an area of the brain which is responsible for emotions and controlling. So those things are affected. And along with that, there is a concept of what we call synaptic pruning. Now, synaptic pruning ka matlab hota hai ki jab newborn bacha paida hota hai, when he borns, there are a lot of connections in the brain, what we call synapse. It's, uh, millions and millions of cells are connected to with each of these. Now, those are millions and millions and billions of uh, connections. Now, as we grow, as we grow and as we reach the age of four to five years, by the six years, those unwanted connections get been off or they get crossed. It's just like, suppose uh, uh, from a distance, it becomes a displacement. Suppose you want to go and open, you want to get a glass of water. So you will follow a displacement, obviously. You won't go for a zigzag path and go to the kitchen and then the glass of water. Your easiest path and the most confident, easiest and efficient path will be directly take a displacement and go into the kitchen. So means to say efficient. So in order to carry out more and more efficient functions, in order to use your logical thinking in a better and better way, obviously as we grow old, our imagination, our logical thinking, our way of efficiency, our work of carrying out the efficiency becomes better and better. Why it becomes better? Because those unwanted connections or synapses which are present in the brain, they get slowly and slowly weaned off. As a result, we are able to follow a strict and specific uh, direction given to us as we grow and we become more and more efficient in our work. This is because the unwanted synapses which are there, they get been off or they get, uh, I would say, die off. So this is what we call as synaptic pruning. Means dying off unwanted connections between the brains, which is required for making our uh, higher logical functions better and better. Now, this thing doesn't happen in the children who are on the spectrum. That is why even when a simple command is given to them, get me a glass of water from kitchen, they will get confused. You have to give them the visual prompt. You have to give them the physical prompt. You might have to follow them with a you know, technique of telling them again and again that get a glass of water. It should be very specific again and again. You have to repeat why. Because that simple command, it follows a zigzag path because of unwanted connections. Either it may go there, it may go there. So they get confused that what command is being given. The, synapse, the left synapse is giving them the command. The right one is giving them the command. So they get confused. That is the problem which happens in the children on the spectrum. That is why we say in a simple language, defective wiring system in the brain or what we call as heat processing different. It's not that they are intellectually disabled. They are not intellectually disabled. Their psychology their brain IQ is absolutely fine. 20% of the kids who are on the spectrum, they have intellectual disability. Intellectual disability is the word it is used when we go for an IQ testing and when it comes out to be less than 80 to 70%. Less than 80 to 70. Normal 90 to 110, but less than 80, 70 or 80, we take it as intellectual disability. So only 20% of the kids who are on the spectrum, they have intellectual disability. But when I give this command, get me a glass of water, 99% of the kids who are on the spectrum at the age of two to three years will not be able to process that command. They may get confused. They may be standing there. Doesn't mean that their IQ is, they are intellectual disabled. It means synaptic pruning has not happened. Processing is affected. So we'll be targeting on that part to the bias. So then coming, there is a lot of, uh, you know, uh, GFCF diet. Now GFCF diet is a very uh, fancy diet for everybody. And uh, for all of us, and uh, most of the parents, without uh, knowing why we have to follow this, why we have to give this, what is the rationale of giving this, if one parent is following, definitely he might get the benefit with GFCF diet. Without thinking, because we are so much connected through the social world, uh, ko result mil gaya, dusra parent bhi sochta hai because uh, autism is such a thing that everybody wants to try something new so that we get better results in our kids. 
so that's basically you are doing for the betterment of the child but sometimes that betterment may cause harm to the child because a gfcf diet one who is following may not be beneficial to other child because a gfcf diet in one child may be suitable with some certain products certain food items by the elimination of certain items another kid might if follow that same gfcf diet may not be beneficial so here we go about talking about the food intolerance test that we will discuss so now first about the problem as i was telling you the leaky gut now why this leaky gut happen now casein and gliadin these are the two proteins which are present in every food product which what we eat now casein is a protein which is present in the milk so milk means dairy a product whatever dairy products you get either it is the product from the goat sheep cow buffalo they contain casein and uh, remember uh, that buffalo milk contains higher amount of casein than compared to the cow milk because sometimes i have seen that parents say that uh, they have gone for a food intolerance test and the buffalo milk has found to be tolerant but uh, cow milk has been found to be tolerant so can we go can we put the child on the buffalo milk no so casein is present in higher amounts in buffalo milk so casein is the one which is present in dairy products gluten is the one which is present in all the product, uh, all the carbohydrates majority of the food products which we eat whether it is a chocolates whether it is a food whether it is ice creams whether are, uh, whether it is medications syrup uh, syrup medications whatever it is so it is present in most of the products majority if we talk about the gluten it is present now gliadin is a breakdown product of gluten so don't get confused between the gluten and the gliadin gliadin is a breakdown product of gluten it is a sub unit of gluten so uh, gluten is present we know that it is present in wheat it is present in barley it is present in rye maida so these are the things now uh, just to add a point on that oats naturally generally when we follow a gluten free diet parents start giving oats now on their part they are absolutely right because oats is naturally gluten free but what is the problem is oats are grown in the same field where the wheat is grown so during the process of harvesting and manufacturing there is a cross contamination happens between the wheat and the oats so because of this cross contamination the chances that the content of oats might also contain small amount of gliadin during the process of manufacturing and processing so when we follow a strict gluten diet it is always advised not to take oats so when this when we take this normal diet the gluten and casein when it is present now this is the gluten and casein which are present they broke they leak through the surface and these are breakdown now gluten and casein when we take suppose we are taking a normal food the gluten and casein which is present it will be absorbed only 80% will be absorbed 20% doesn't get absorbed in a neurotypical child or in any person so that 20% breakdown products are known as caseomorphin it is there in the slide caseomorphin and gliadiomorphin it is only 20% so it doesn't cause any harm and it gets excreted out to the body or even 20% if it is absorbed to the brain doesn't cause any harm but the problem is with the persons who are on the spectrum this gluten and casein it doesn't get absorbed in the children who are on the spectrum and in those only 20% is absorbed the remaining 80% that is the caseomorphin and gliadiomorphin the these are the residual or the breakdown products of gluten casein that doesn't get absorbed now these 80% of the product that doesn't get absorbed this is the blood brain barrier this is the blood uh, and this is the blood and this is the brain they enter the brain when they enter the brain they get bind to the opioid receptors opioid receptors means morphine ye charas ganja jaise receptors un pe ye bind ho jate hain now this is the structure hypothetical structure which is being shown there they get bind to the uh, neuronal receptors there and when they get bind now these caseomorphin gluadiomorphin they have the property of an opioid imagine when you are taking morphine you will be like hallucinations you will be having behavioral changes you will be agitated you will be feeling as though an helicopter is moving in front of me or you will be so much in your own world with hallucinations delusions and everything will be happening so similarly in those kids in which the gluten in which the normal diet like gluten or casein is given and and they are having this intolerance issues of gluten casein that products do not get absorbed and they reach the brain as a result we have seen when the child who is having food intolerance issues to gluten and casein takes a normal diet containing gluten and casein we might see we might see that his sensory issues shoot up shoot up his behavioral issues gets increased agitation increases gut issues gets worsen and immediately when we switch to a gfcf diet then we find that his things get settled down over a period of time 
So this is the basis that why this glutenin casein is a culprit in children who are on the spectrum. Now it is present in more than 70% of the kids who are on the spectrum, they have glutenin casein intolerance. But again, it doesn't mean that every child should start with a GFCF diet. We should go for a food intolerance test. Now, food intolerance that we have discussed in our previous webinars, if some of the, if the parents have attended, where we have discussed about the role of food in autism, where we have discussed about the food intolerance and food allergy. Now, food allergy is different and food intolerance is different. Food allergy, here they will be testing IgE levels, which is an immediate reaction. Suppose a child is allergic to egg. He will take egg and within a half an hour, he will de or develop rashes all over the body. He'll be sweating or he will not be comfortable. But if a child is intolerant to egg, he may not develop, uh, it, uh, I mean, the allergies or the rashes or side effects immediately. That may develop up to a period of one month or two months. Why? Because, you, because intolerance develops through IgG levels. Now, IgG are type of antibodies which remain in our body for a period of two to three months. So that is why we say that if your child is having intolerance to gluten and casein and if he's consuming gluten and casein, he might develop symptoms not necessarily immediately. He might develop after one month, may after two months. So it's very important that when we start giving a GFCF diet, at least a minimum period of four to five months is considered. Generally, when I give a biomet plan for parents, I generally follow a minimum period of four to six months of GFCF diet before thinking of adding the gluten or casein in the diet. But yes, always our food intolerance panel test is a checklist for us to determine whether the children is uh, what is the percentage, what is the level of intolerance, because there are different levels of intolerance, mild, moderate, and severe. Along with that, we can also get the yeast issues, what is the level of the yeast. Along with that, generally what happens, we know that walnuts and uh, walnuts, tofu, or even uh, chia seeds, hemp seeds, they are very good sources of omega So we might not be giving, we, the child might be on a GFCF diet, and we'll be giving them coconut, we'll be giving them uh, walnuts, we'll be giving them all nuts. But when we go for an intolerance test, they might be having intolerance to nuts also. And around 20 to 25 percent of the kids who are on the spectrum, they have intolerance to nuts. So if we go for an intolerance test, we get an idea. Yes, intolerance is also found to be to these nuts. So as a result, we avoid giving those nuts to the children accordingly. What as alternative sources? Now it's uh, it's very easy to check the food intolerance report and stop gluten and casein and. But the problem is we can start with the other sources like GF market may gluten free ata milta, gluten free things. Hai. But the problem is when we are stopping gluten and casein in the diet, we are compromising on the child nutrition. So it's very important that simultaneously what nutrition in what dose, what amount has to be given to the child because it's the growing age of the child. We cannot play with this nutrition. So it's very important that adequate amount of nutrition has to be added simultaneously when we are removing the gluten and casein from them. So that is the importance of uh, going into details of gluten and casein food intolerance and the GFCF diet. Now, again, come the other part, which is the culprit is the gut brain axis. Now, uh, gut brain axis, again, I have told now, this is the, this is the brain. Now the diagram is very much clear. Uh, the, uh, the brain is upward and uh, the down is the gut. Now the gut contains a lot of bacteria. We know that it, there, are, uh, there are always a ratio of the good and the bad bacteria. Now, some ba good bacteria which are always required for a body are, I have always mentioned uh, uh, that lactobacillus species and bifidobacterium species. They are around 12 to 13 beneficial bacteria. There are different species of uh, lactobacillus and bifidobacteria are there, which are very much considered to be beneficial in the gut of every child. So it has been found in studies that children who are on the spectrum, the gut of the gut of the children they are very, very low in bifidobacteria and lactobacillus. And in 2011, there was a study done in AIMS. And I have uh, shown this in our gut dysbiosis uh, webinar also, that what was found that when they did, when they studied the, they did the RNA sequences, which is a very high technique of uh, detecting the, uh, these cultures of these strains of bacteria. So what they found on one side, they took the uh, they, uh, they took the ASD kids and on the other side they take the neurotypical kids and they studied the feces or the stool samples and this there they found that the children who were on the spectrum children who were on the spectrum the st the stool samples contain higher amounts of bifidobacterium and lactobacillus 
whereas children who are on the neurotypical they were containing less amount of these now why the stool was containing more amount of bifidobacterium and lactobacilli which are considered to be good and beneficial in children who are on the spectrum because of the leaky gut because there was a leaky gut in the children who are on the spectrum we know that and as a result it was not being absorbed they were leaking out and passing into the stools as a result the samples of children in the spectrum they were having high amounts of bifidobacteria and lactobacillus that is why we always want to feed our kids to the probiotic specifically containing these amount of strains those 12 to 14 then now because of this gut dysbiosis or what we call disturbance of the gut microbiota they release lot of toxins when they release the toxins these toxins they causes the disturbance they release the toxin they release the markers in our brain which causes the inflammation now those markers are interleukin and etc etc that is uh, beyond the scope of this lecture but they release uh, uh, they release chemicals which cause the inflammation of the brain when the amount of bad bacteria increases now as a result they reach the brain and causes the neuro inflammation now this is the neuro inflammation means swelling of the brain how they bind to those receptors which are cause in the brain and they causes aggression hyperactivity uh it's just like they will cause the symptoms as though ch the child is under the impression of morphine similar symptoms the child will be uh, getting that is aggression hyperactivity etc along with that there is they also cause these toxins also cause the disturbance between the serotonin glutamate and gaba now serotonin is the most important hormone which is responsible for regulation of our emotion and interestingly uh we all know that serotonin is produced in the brain but we don't know that 90% of the serotonin it is produced from the gut that is from the microbiota the gut the beneficial bacteria which are present in the our gut so only 10% of serotonin is produced in the brain the 90% of the serotonin which is responsible for our emotions regulations and thoughts is produced from the gut so that is the uh, idea behind all this if your gut is healthy the brain will be healthy because if your gut is disturbed it will disturb the balance between the neurotransmitters through the release of toxins that is between the serotonin the glutamate and gaba now there is a balance between the glutamate and gaba glutamate is an excitatory gaba is an inhibitory when this toxin release the glutamate will shoots up the gaba release down as a result the child may go in a state of hyperactivity aggression throwing things sensory issues higher so this is the connection between the gut and brain axis now it is vice versa it is not that it's only going through the gut and the brain it will be going from the brain to the gut also so if the brain is it's vice versa the gut disturb the brain will be having hyperactivity and aggression so the brain will be sending you a negative feedback so as a result it will be worsening the so here what we give we give consider because on these parameters we give probiotics by making a bacteria in a good healthy state now again there is a controversy should we give probiotics should we give prebiotics or should we give a combination of the two now uh, there is a one thing which is very uh, important between a probiotic and a prebiotic is probiotic these are the live bacteria these are live good bacteria there are hundreds of probiotics which are available in the market but here the probiotic which i am talking is specifically which is containing those 10 to 12 strains of lactobacillus and bifidobacteria so when we talk when we give a probiotic probiotic is a live bacteria containing good beneficial strains so these are live bacteria which we are injecting to the body prebiotic is a feeding material it's just like a feed like we eat daily breakfast dinner it's just like a it's prebiotic is just like a breakfast dinner and lunch which we give to the body so when we the when a child takes a prebiotic it's a food which goes inside the gut and it acts as a food for the good and the bad bacteria so a prebiotic will be taken either by the bad bacteria or maybe by the good bacteria so there will be a competition between the good and the bad bacteria if uh, good bacteria is win the results will be better if a bad bacteria is when like the results will be worsen so that is why we might have seen sometime there is a waxing and waning in the gut issues of the children sometime he will, his gut will be very healthy he will be digestion and everything will be fine bloating gas issues will be fine and during that stage we will find that his mood his sensory his thoughts his calmness is better but there will be some days in life where his a gut will be very very disturbed and we will directly correlate that during that period of gut his thoughts his behaviors his uh, aggression his uh, lack of attention and everything gets worsened so that is why because we might be giving a prebiotic when we give a pre probiotic when we give a probiotic we are just giving the live bacteria so there is no question of raising the bad bacteria in our body so we will be just increasing the number of the good bacteria digestive enzymes the role of digestive enzymes is to 
improve the digestibility of the function because children who are on the spectrum, as we know, because of the detoxification, every cell in the body will be affected like pancreas, which are responsible for the secretion of large amount of digestive enzymes like pancreases or peptidases and et cetera, et cetera, which help in smoothing the aid of digestion. We know that digestion is disturbed in the kids along with bloating and et cetera. Why? Because of the, because of functioning of the smoothest, because the functioning is not smooth. So the role of digestive enzymes, which may be useful in improving the gut. Now, all these roles which we are discussing, it's not that it will be 100% applicable to every kid. It, we have to give a lot of times hit and trial. Sometimes we have to reduce that. Sometimes we have to give that. So it's just that these are the approaches which have been tried and which have been found to be beneficial in children who are this way. Now, again, now uh, this is a diagram to make you understand between the synaptic pruning. What is synaptic pruning? So again, it is related to the gut. So uh, as we are going more and more in the discussion, you will be able to find out that our discussion is getting narrower and narrower more towards the gut microbiota. Because gut microbiota has been proved beyond any doubt to play a major role in all clinical conditions specifically related to neuropsychiatric or neurodevelopmental disorders in children. So if there is a, now what can disturb the gut? Now above is the picture of the gut microbiota, which is the balanced gut microbiota. And below you can see it is a dysregulated gut microbiota. Now this microbiota, Starting can be affected. Now, again, I won't go into the detail because we have discussed about gut dysbiosis. This gut microbiota can be affected right from the period when the mother is when the mother conceives. During that first trimester only, the gut microbiota of the child can be disturbed by the eating habits of the mother, what kind of food it she eats, what type of antibiotics has been taken, what was the stress level, what was the epigenetics. Epigenetics means your surrounding area, the stress, the environmental stress which the mother might have faced. The mode of delivery, whether it was a uh, normal delivery or the cesarean, what type of antibiotics, what was the stress level, what amount of calcium was there, uh, whether they were taken iron and calcium, whether the mother was anemic. So all these factors can affect the gut microbiota. After the birth, yes, what type of food the child is eating, what was the course of antibiotics. So there are so many things which can affect. So, so once the gut microbiota, is, if it is a gut microbiota is normal in the above, above pig which is showing, that the gut microbiota is normal. So this is the normal synaptic pruning. Now, if you see these prunings, you will find in the above diagram, the connections are very, very less. Whereas the, if you come down in the second and the third, where they have mentioned decrease and delayed synaptic pruning, the connections, the branches are increased. You can see in the, you can compare the first and the third, the branches of the tree. Now, this is the root. Imagine this is the root, this is the stem, and these are the branches of the tree. So the branches of the tree are little reduced in number as we go down. And that is the thing, what we call as synaptic, I mean the, synap uh, the branching has increased in number. I'm sorry, the branching as we go down, the branching is increasing in number. So as a result, the synaptic pruning is not happening. So this is the problem which happens in children who are on the spectrum and attention deficit disorder. Now delayed synaptic pruning and decreased synaptic pruning are little more technical. So in a broader term, if we want to discuss here is just we have to more focus on synaptic pruning and synaptic pruning is not happening. So normal synaptic pruning means unwanted connections should resolve by the period of four to six years. But children who are on the spectrum, there is a delayed synaptic pruning or the synaptic pruning doesn't happen. Now, again, to make you understand a bit, delayed synaptic pruning means we might have seen a child may be on the spectrum. He may be on a mild spectrum. So by the time he reaches the age of 10 to 12 years, 11 years, 12 years, he might be just close to a neurotypical child. Definitely no child in the spectrum can become a normal child. Normal, I'm sorry, no, it's not normal, it's a neurotypical. So it's not possible that a child who's in the spectrum will become after 10 to 15 years a neurotypical child, no. They'll be, but yes, they can modify the abilities. We know that they are very specific, they are very peculiar, so they can utilize the modity, uh, their abilities as they grow in their period in their life. But yes, they cannot come in the neurotypical spectrum. So decreased synaptic pruning means a child who might be in the mild spectrum during the period of eight to 19, uh, by the age of 10 to 12 years, he becomes almost close to a neurotypical child. So that means in that child, the decreased synaptic pruning is happened. It should happen by the age of four to six years, but it happened in this child by the age of 10 to 12 years. So slowly and slowly he comes out. So children who are on the mild spectrum, 
are having decreased synaptic pruning rather than I would say there is no synaptic pruning. But children who are on the spectrum, who are severe spectrum, who car score is high or they have a lot of sensory issues, there we can say in these children, the synaptic pruning is not delayed. It is in fact doesn't happen or it is almost decreased. So this is the difference between the brain imaging between the synaptic pruning in a mild, moderate or severe. Now there are two uh, molecules, lutein and NAC and acetylcysteine. These are molecules of research and they have not been tried in humans as of now. NAC has been tried, lutein has not been tried as such. Now lutein is basically, an, uh, it's basically a beta carotene which is produced from the plant. Now this lutein is supposed to act on the synaptic pruning and improve the synaptic pruning. Research is being done on this molecule. It's a plant hormone, so definitely there won't be any side effects with this. It's a beta carotene, which is very, very useful for our vision, for different functions of our body. So it's a natural plant source, which is produced in all the green leafy vegetables like spinach, broccoli, and etc. So this product is being studied under a lot of research because this product is found to be useful in improve, I would say, in improving the synaptic pruning, which is being not happening smoothly in the children on the spectrum. So in uh, years to come or in the later years, uh, it will be a good or a breakthrough in this medic biomedical approaches with if this lutein products gets approved for the use of in synaptic pruning. Although it will not be approved by FDA because all these things have not been approved by FDA, but yes, Different, different societies are working, RCTs are being carried out by different organizations like Canada Autism Organization and different, different organizations are there which are working on this. But if I go specifically through the Cochrane Review, if I go through the, I would say FDA, there are no uh, medication, I would say no nutrition, nothing is approved by FDA. They don't approve anything. They just approve only one, that is the Shizodon. But we know that those are the side effects, these are transient. So biomedical approaches basically alters those parts. That can be very easily given, but that is uh, not being uh, part of the biomedical spectrum because when we talk about biomedical treatment, these are alternative approaches compared to the conservative. Now in autism, conservative is only two in terms of medication. Either we can give schizodon or we can give CNS stimulants like methylphenidate, etomocetine, and etc. That we uh, discuss because they have a lot of very uh, harmful effects. Okay. 
uh, is it visible? So the slide is visible. Hello. Yes, sir. Okay. So now we are coming to the gut issues. So this uh, this was the thing which we're discussing about the gut microbiota. That the, then we have the gut issues. Now in the gut issues, the problem is again why uh, we have discussed about the gut dysbiosis and everything. Now the other issue which happens in the gut dysbiosis or uh, the gut issues is the dysregulation or the immunity. The immunity of the children who are in the spectrum it is very very poor. You know that they have a lot of uh, diarrheal issues. They may be having a lot of cough and cold. They may be having frequent adenoids, hypertrophy, recurrent infections. Now, why does that happen? Now, this happens because now this structure which is being shown, these are the immunoglobulins in the body. Now, there are basically two different types of immunoglobulin. We won't go into the detail, but there are different two types of immunoglobulins, IgA and IgG. Now, IgA is the immunoglobulin or the antibody which is responsible for providing gut immunity but means specifically it provides the gut immunity it will keep the mucosa the lining of the mucosa there won't be any leaky gut it will keep the gut healthy there won't be any uh, frequent bloats diarrhea and etc and etc other is the igg igg is the uh, body which helps in preventing infections in the body like bad bacteria we know that bad bacteria are always present in the gut so those igg it will be acting as a shield so bad bacteria won't be able to cross uh, inside and enter our cells so it will be acting like a shield so bad bacteria will track and get back so these two antibodies iga and igg which plays a very important role in providing the immunity are in less number or they are not acting or mature enough to carry out these functions so because of this dysregulation of the immunity especially with igg and iga they are more prone for different sources of infections and infection. now gut dysbiosis again we have discussed that is this is the typical diagram which i have shown you about the gut dysbiosis how we can see in this that uh, these are the gut dysbiosis picture which have been shown that there on the left side this is the normal gut which shows that is the lactobacilli and bifidobacteria these are the good beneficial bacteria which are high in number whereas if we compare the gut dysbiosis or the bad bacteria, there we will see that the amount of bad bacteria are very, very high, like different candida, clepsia, and different species, but the good bacteria, like lecto and bifido, they are very less in number. So this is what we call the gut dysbiosis. Now, leaky gut, now again, the leaky gut syndrome, we have disturbed, discussed that why the cause of the leaky gut happens, because of the autoimmune, why this autoimmune diseases happen, I mean the recurrent cough and cold infections, now here comes the importance of food intolerance. See GI issues and food, multiple food intolerances. Why? Because of this multiple food intolerance, why it happens? Because of the intolerance to gluten and casein. That is the response, that is the uh, speciality, or that is the importance of going for this food intolerance test so that we get to know the idea about these, uh, what are the intolerance levels or different uh, foods. And accordingly, we can work on the leaky gut, we can work on the different spectrums of nutrition, malabsorption, and etc. Just give me a second. I'll just make it a slideshow.
ओके सॉरी फॉर द इंट्रप्शन so again now we were coming to this again the gut brain axis which we have discussed now this gut and the brain again they are connected with the gut and the brain which we have discussed as i have told you they are connected through the different neurotransmitters like glutamate gaba they are again connected to the different nerves and all this happens because of the disturbance between the gut and the brain now when we are following the biomed plan we always try to focus on the gut healing we try to focus on the detoxification we try to focus on the nutrition we try to focus on the diet the leaky gut factors along with that because we know that children who are picky eaters they will be very very choosy about a particular type of food no 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 matter they will be having oromotor sensory issues which might also be a, a adding factor for them but because along with that those uh, picky eating behavior can also cause lot of disturbances lot of deficiency in the children so because of that we have to give them a balanced uh, amount of nutrition supplementation so that those deficiencies especially like calcium vitamin d deficiencies they are found in more than 80% of the kids now many a times when we go for the calcium levels they are normal but we might see that many kids who are on the spectrum they have a history of frequent falls and getting fractures very frequently compared to the children who are or a neurotypical so when we go for the bone density that is the density the bone density when we go the amount of uh, how dense the bone is they are found to be very very low now why that bone density is low because the bone forming cells are not mature enough why they are not mature enough is because again the amount of food the um, type of food and the balanced diet which we are taking is not smooth or sufficient enough other factor is this because of the gut dysbiosis the microbiota is disturbed the amount of absorption of calcium and vitamin d is low when this absorption is low then definitely the amount of calcium vitamin d which will be going into the bones to make our bones strong will also be low so as a result the density of the uh, uh, bones comes out to be low so ultimately the thing is that we have to target to these approaches so that we are able to target the associated uh, problems which are surrounding this spectrum so uh, so as this diagram clearly shows that if your gut is disturbed there will be gut dysbiosis there will be gi disturbances like bloating etc and etc which can further worsen your psychological symptoms they will disorders and all those uh, mood swings and everything and if there is a stress in the brain it can uh, cause a negative feedback into the body so they can be a disturbance between the glutamate gaba and uh, neurotransmitter so then we have uh, this now conditions which have been linked to gut dysbiosis now there are so many conditions which have been linked to gut dysbiosis irritable bowel autism anxiety but our main concern is autism so this is just a diagram to show that how many uh, diseases are there which has been associated with gut gut dysbiosis now this leaky gut progression now again as i was telling that leaky gut is a big problem which can happen due to majority of the causes it can be stress it can be toxins again the type of food which we are taking the drugs the pathogens and the organ malfunction now organ malfunction is something different so the main things which can happen is stress that is the epigenetics now nowadays we talk about the stress that is the epigenetics that is the environmental surroundings how it can affect your genes now other than genetic disorders now it is more important your epigenetics how it is disturbing your body how your thoughts imagines and thoughts so what we call as epigenetic the environmental surroundings how it affect your thoughts and ability that can definitely affect your gut it can affect and worsen your gut along with that toxins here the toxins which we talk about is the antibiotics 
food particles like gluten and caseomorphin, the breakdown products. So along with that deficiency of omega, which is also a big problem, then uh, uh, immunity, the decreased immunity, that is, which is responsible for maintaining a smooth functioning of the mucosal lining of the, I mean, the lining of the mucosa, so that the leaky gut doesn't happen, is just like this. Suppose we have a normal gut like this, there gaps happens between the guts. So as a result, there is a release of toxins and everything. And because of this factor, as I mentioned early in the study, the amount of lactobacillus and bifidobacteria were found to be higher in stools of autistic kids. Now, methylation cycle. Now, this methylation cycle, this is the purpose of going for the B12. Now, I have shared this methylation cycle in our uh, group also. So now see, methylation cycle is a very complex cycle. The main purpose of this methylation cycle is we have a cycle what we call as methylation cycle. It releases a lot of groups which are called as methyl groups or CH3 groups. Now, uh, B12 is present. I, B12 is present in both forms. It can be present hydroxycobalamin, cyanocobalamin, methylcobalamin. But the important active form for us is methylcobalamin. So when this methylcobalamin, it is not functioning smoothly because of this smooth uh, methylation cycle is not working smoothly, the amount of methyl groups which are produced are also less. And those methyl groups, they carry out majority of the functions in our body because this methyl groups gets transferred to our mitochondria and it acts as a fuel. And when this methyl groups goes to the mitochondria, mitochondria have told it's like an engine and it is connected to the different cells of our body. See, this is the diagram, mitochondria engine of our body. This is our mitochondria. These are the different cells of a body, which are millions and millions of cells. And this is the methyl group, which is the fuel. Now, this methyl group is coming from this cycle that is the methylation cycle. This is the methylation cycle. When this methylation cycle is rotating like this, it is dispersing methyl groups. And when these methyl groups are being disturbed, they get entered into the mitochondria. And this mitochondria then starts functioning like detoxification, smoothing, and majority of the functions which are there. And it is believed because of this mitochondrial dysfunctioning, why this mitochondrial dysfunction is there? Because methyl groups are not being happening smoothly. The fuel is not coming. It's just like your engine will not move unless and until you don't have a fuel. So if you don't have a fuel, the engine will not move. The engine will not move. The rest of the bogies will be standing on the track. Similarly, it's like our structure in the body. We require fuel. We require methyl groups for the mitochondria. So because of this mitochondrial dysfunctioning, because of the less amount of methyl groups, we have a lot of different spectrum picture. And it is believed mitochondria is responsible for the majority of the functions, whether it is breakdown of protein, whether it is a bodybuilding, uh, whether it is a formation of carbohydrates, processing, whether it is the learning, it is judgment, thoughts, academics, speech, everything is considered to be functioning associated with the mitochondria. So what are the symptoms of mitochondrial dysfunction? Now, again, it is not mitochondrial disorder, it is dysfunction. Here, the mitochondria is not disordered. It is just that the dysfunctioning is, uh, it is dysfunction. It is not happening smoothly. Why? Because the B12, the methyl group which is required is not happening. So when we give, when we, in a biomed plan, we follow B12. We don't give cyanocobalamin. We don't give hydroxycobalamin. We give B12. Now, in B12, there is a saying that uh, should we give injectable B12 shots, should we give oral? Now, the re reason is when we give injectable B12 shots, it has to be given every alternate, third. it has to be given every third day and it has to be continued for a period of 18, 12 to 18 months. Again, the important thing is it is cyanocobalamin and the dose which is present, the vial which comes, it is 25 mg per ml, which is not available in India. In India, we don't get a cyanocobalamin which is present in injectable form. It has to be in a particular dose of 25 mg per ml, which is not available in India. So, if any of the uh, one which are giving, we have to fetch it from uh, US and then it has to be given. Another big problem is the compliance because it has to be given every third day to the child. And when it is given to every third day, it is being given on the skin. IM injection is given, which is directly gets absorbed. as subcutaneous IM is given. And because of that, they can be transient side effects. They can be a lot of mouthing. They can be aggression. They can be a lot of mouthing issues can develop. There will be transient sensory changes will be there. So. Uh, giving IM, uh, giving this uh, B12 shots is actually uh, cumbersome and it requires a lot of compliance. There is a loss of follow up and there may be side effects. So monitoring is very, very important. So it should not be given. Uh, it should not be given without the guidance of a proper doctor who is giving these B12 shots in children on the spectrum. So if we go to the oral form. Now, in oral form, the B12 which we are giving is little in a higher dose. Why? Because we know that the gut is poor, absorption is poor. 
so whenever we give b12 only 50, only 20% of the b12 is absorbed from the gut rest is not absorbed because of the poor absorption because of the gut issues and other auto uh, immunity disorders which are present in the kids so when we give b12 we give in a higher dose considering that only 5 to 20% will be absorbed so when we give b12 we are directly providing the methyl groups to the mitochondria and because of this mitochondrial functioning gets better speech comes better development comes better intellect now how much it will uh, individual how much benefit will get that totally depends from individual to individual nobody can say that you give b12 you will get this thing. it's not at all possible but definitely when we follow this plans gradually gradually we might get improvement on various parameters of children but saying all this we should not forget the basic therapies of sensory integration and occupational and etc and etc so because it's a spectrum so we have to fight from all the cause so symptoms of mitochondrial dysfunction speech delay regression social impairment uh, neuropsychiatric as they have told seizures headaches hearing impairment auditory sensitivity issues gut issues so means to say whatever number you say it is due to the mitochondrial dysfunction because mitochondria is an engine and if the engine is disturbed your cells will be disturbed it's as simple as it then you have this again now see uh this is a very interesting diagram which i have shown this is the pie chart which shows that this is the autism spectrum part and inside this are the mitochondrial dysfunction so again you see that 30 to 80% of the children are having mitochondrial dysfunction so how varied is the percentage so it means to say that almost 90% of the kids who are on the spectrum will be having mitochondrial dysfunction so as a result when we target on mitochondrial dysfunction we have to look into the role of coenzymes because coenzymes are very very important in smoothing the function of mitochondria l carnitine l carnitine is an important parameter which tells you to tells how smooth the mitochondria is being functioning if we go for the testing of mitochondria uh, we go for the testing of l carnitine we can get an idea that yes mitochondria is uh, functioning smooth but it doesn't mean that if l carnitine comes out to be normal mitochondria the dysfunction is not there no because it is only one of the parameters there are other parameters which unfortunately are not very easily available in india so taking into a broad spectrum that 30 to 80% of the kids who are in the spectrum we target by mitochondrial we target by a mitochondrial smoothing functioning through biomet plan because uh, because we know that the percentage of mitochondrial dysfunction is very high on the children spectrum and also through the clinical judgment and also through the various history gut issues and other parameters we come to know that yes the child is having mitochondrial dysfunction so we can work so when we work on this mitochondrial dysfunction we have to look into the role of coenzymes like coenzyme q10 we have to look into b12 we have to look into coenzymes l carnitine now again b12 so uh, when we give b12 i prefer to give in oral form rather than giving in injectable form because of the uh, compliances and the side effects uh, which are associated with giving b12 so uh, this is again the same diagram mitochondrial dysfunction as i have told you again it is uh, how oxidative stress happens because of the gut dysbiosis which can further function the mitochondrial dysfunction and can affect our thinking thoughts and other functioning of the cells so again uh, this is again how i have told you that epigenetics epigenetics as i have told that genetics epigenetics and microbiome these are the three important things now genetics have been left aside because we cannot do much about genetics but we can work a lot about epigenetics and microbiome now this is our role through biomet plan that we have to work on the epigenetics we have to work on the microbiome because whenever we discuss nowadays microbiome is the main thing which is affecting our body if you see this chart microbiome along with this affects all other parameters there will be synaptic dysfunctioning there will be immune dysregulation there will be oxidative stress oxidative stress means uh, the glutathione now that methylation cycle which we have described now this methylation cycle it releases lot of methyl groups now methyl group is very very important in producing glutathione now glutathione is a natural antioxidant in our body now what happens uh, when we are working when we are working so much and so much when we are tired when our body metabolize rate is very very high lot of methyl groups are produced so what happens they produce glutamate and when uh, just imagine that uh, there is a neurotypical child who is very uh, who is running here and there and he is very aggression he is very anxious and he is very uh, but after some time he settles down why because definitely we know that during that period the glutamate levels uh, has increased we know that gaba and glutamate glutamate is an excitatory the glutamate level increase but this methyl group which produces glutathione which is a natural antioxidant it absorbs this glutamate as a result after some time 
the child comes in a normal state, he gets calmed down. But similar thing doesn't happen in the children who are on the spectrum. They will keep, once they are in a state of hyper excitability, it may go up to, um, it will go up to one hour, two hour, unless and until some external force like parents, mothers come and intervene. So here we have to give, what we have to give? We have to give, uh, because why? Because the methylation cycle is not functioning smooth. So as a result, the glutathione, which is being produced by the methyl group is not produced. And we know that glutathione is a natural antioxidant which absorbs the glutamate. But since glutathione is not, since this uh, glutathione is not present or it is less in children who are on the spectrum, the amount of glutamate always remains in a higher state. So this we have discussed, functions of mitochondria, redox potential. And again, this is the same. So just to summarize, then whenever we follow a biomedical intervention plan, we should, our focus should be on what? Our focus should be on diet. Uh, now diet, it doesn't mean what specific elimination diet we have to follow, whether we have to follow a GFCF diet, whether we have to follow a body ecology diet, whether we have to follow a specific carbohydrate diet, that has to be individualized by child to child. Then again, the important role of complex versus simple carbs. Now complex carbohydrates are those which, which have a low glycemic index, means which are absorbed slowly in our body and which produce slow amount of gradual amount of sugar levels in the body. Simple means like beverages, like cold drinks, juices. You imagine when you take a beverage or a soft drink, your energy level shoots up immediately. Why? Because they are immediately absorbed in our body and the glucose shoots up in the body. So complex versus simple carbs are very important to uh, check in the yeast tissues. Because yeast tissues, for the yeast to grow, sugars is a very good medium, oxalates, and the citrus. These are the three important factors which can worsen the yeast disease. So use of other sources of food to compensate for the removal of gluten and casein is another important thing. They remove gluten and casein from the diet, but what, are the, what about the removal of gluten and casein? How we have to compensate for those proteins and carbohydrates which we are removing from the body? So here comes the role of food intolerance, which is very crucial. Along with that, the role of a person or a professional who is very much involved in this nutrition plan and diets, whatever you, but you have to be in touch with the professional so that there doesn't happen the nutritional deficiencies and child doesn't go in a state of, you know, uh, starvation or anything. Oxalate diet, depending upon the level of oxalates, because they are very, very important in checking the role of yeast and fungus. Because many a times we see that the child is following on a GFC of diet, but in spite of that, oxalate levels are very, very high. And those oxalate levels can worsen the yeast tissue. So keep a check on the oxalates accordingly and accordingly we have to modify whether we have to give a low oxalate diet, high oxalate diet, so diet modification for the yeast tissues, like whether we have to give a body ecology diet, whether we have to give uh, antifungal medications if the cultures are come out to be positive depending upon the severity. Gut dysbiosis, what gut is for the gut dysbiosis should be used probiotics, should be used prebiotics, how should, what strains should be used as we have discussed in detail about why prebiotics should be, why probiotics should be preferred over prebiotics. Mitochondrial dysfunction and methylation defect. These are the important things which should be enrolled when we are giving up, uh, when we are preparing a biomedical plan or when a biomedical plan is being given. Whether we should give B12 shots or we should give oral B12. Now there are sublingual B12 is also available which we keep below the neck. It has no role. It's hardly 2% of it is absorbed from the sublingual, that is the oral cavity. So there is no role of giving oral beat, uh, I mean the sublingual. Then use of coenzyme L-carnitine and omega, methylcobalamin versus cyanocobalamin versus hydrocobalamin. There are three different forms of cobalamin, uh, uh, B12, which I have told you. But as I've told, the important thing is methylcobalamin because many a times if we go for the B12 test, you will get the B12 normal. Then the parents, uh, then uh, you might ask, the, so why we are taking this B12, B12 to our kid when the B12 levels is normal? If the reason is because when we go for the B12 test, they check the blood levels of B12, which is cyanocobalamin. They never test methylcobalamin. You check the B12 levels in the bracket, they will be mentioning cyanocobalamin be tested by this method. So it is cyanocobalamin. We are concerned with methylcobalamin, which is, or which is, which does not get tested in the normal lab. Or normal, it's generally they don't test it for methylcobalamin. It is generally the cyanocobalamin. So the role of B12 test, I have told, it's the role of B12 test is only to check whether the level of cyanocobalamin is low or not. If it is low, then we have to first treat the cyanocobalamin, then accordingly we have to work on the methylcobalamin. Heavy metals, role of chelation. Now there is no role of chelation. Heavy metals like lead, mercury and etc. even if they are found to be higher, it is because of the oromotor sensory issues. Why? 
because oromotor sensory issues is the problem which causes lot of mouthing and smelling as a result children are taking lot of non edible things like toys paints etc and rubbers crayons all of them contain heavy metals and as a result of which it is found that the lead levels and heavy metals are higher for chelation to happen the level should be at least 10 to 20 times higher means the level should be at least 60 to 70 microgram per deciliter above the level to go for a chelation and chelation cannot be given by oral it is only iv chelation which requires hospitalization and there are lot of uh, literature and everything which has been proved beyond we have discussed also many a lot times and in fact we are doing a study also and we have also sent it for uh, we are it's under a uh, hopefully it should get published in another 6 months or so we are doing a role of this oral placement therapy in relation to heavy metals that once we give we have uh, we give oral placement therapy to the children and the levels of lead and heavy metals came down it is because of that which clearly shows that chelation is not required and it's the role of oral placement therapy working on the oromotor issues so that the heavy met that uh, mouthing and smelling comes down as a result the exposure because the exposure of lead is only through the mouthing and inhale and smelling it comes down. then yeast issues the role of lime oxalate and sugars the role of glycemic index which i have told you complex versus uh, simple so this a uh, role of lime oxalate versus sugar that is the role of uh, glycemic index we know that foods which are high in glycemic index they will have high amount of sugar which because sugar is a very good medium for the yeast to grow so it can burst in those citrus which all because now here the citrus the some citrus fruits like grapes oranges kiwis watermelon they have a high glycemic index now here the glycemic index doesn't mean the simple white sugar here it means glycemic index basically means the duration or the time in which it produces the sugar or the carbohydrate produces sugar in the body the breakdown product to produce the sugar so the time duration is very important if you are taking something which increases which increases your sugar levels immediately within seconds definitely the yeast issues will be and if you are taking something which increases your yeast uh, sugar levels gradually over a period of 2 to 3 hours gradually so there the chances of yeast are very very low so that is why i prefer to give complex carbohydrates rather than giving simple carbohydrates and uh, like some food items are there like rice which are gluten free potatoes which are gluten free but they are simple carbs so they can they have to be avoided in children who are having yeast issues but avoidance is not the problem what has to be supplemented is the problem so that is why you uh, it's there comes the role of a professional or the person so that you can take a proper guidance and it's because it's easy to follow this thing but important is how to supplement and how to add on to the nutrients which we are not giving through the restricted diet then potential causes of yeast as i have discussed yeast like oxalate citrus gut dysbiosis and carbs these are the four important parameters around which the yeast issues circle so potential causes of yeast issues sugar simple carbs antibiotic overuse and steroids now antibiotic overuse we know that steroids we know that but sugars and simple carbs as i have told you in the previous slides is a very big factor which while following a gfcf diet which we forget or we may not take into consideration while following this now sleeping issues disturbance of serotonin gaba and glutamate as i have told gut is also big problem gut dysbiosis which can disturb the sleeping issues so uh, we have seen many times if your gut is healthy the sleeping issues also comes down role of uh, melatonin melatonin trial is always given only at the end when your other parameters of sleeping issues are not being resolved gut major source of serotonin as i have discussed 90% of the serotonin is produced from the gut which is responsible for your emotions your thoughts definitely hence it plays a very important role in sleeping so if your gut is not healthy your sleeping issues cannot be resolved melatonin trial is why it is given because melatonin is a hormone which is produced by our brain and during the night why we go for a sleep because during the night the melatonin is normally secreted in our body and it induces sleep but in children who are on the spectrum the melatonin secretion is naturally hampered as a result we give a trial of melatonin in children in spite of trial of probiotic in spite of trial of other parameters of uh, anxiety hyperactivity amygdala hypothalamus as i have told you they are very important regulating this anxiety 
Now here in anxiety and hyperactivity, there is a role of caffeine and LDL. Hyperactivity, aggression, we sometimes we give CNS stimulants like methylphenidate, etomozidine. But yes, the problem is individual has to uh, always weigh the risks versus benefits. We know that the side effects, their dependency is very, very high. So here comes the importance that we try to give something alternatively which has benefits. Now, caffeine and NLTN in combination has found there is an RCT. I, I forgot to share it in the slide, but I will put it in the group. It is a very uh, latest RCT which has been done. And we know that RCT is the best, uh, you know, uh, studies or trials compared to cohort and those who are from uh, background of stats. So they have found that the combination of caffeine and L-theanine reduces the hyperactivity and aggression. And many a times, uh, you might have seen many of our parents have gone for an EEG test. And the neurologist might have advice for an EEG testing and they might give you that, yes, EEG is abnormal with a lot of hyperactivity in the brain. But the child has never thrown any seizures, his sleeping is fine, but there is a lot of hyperactivity and in the brain. And you may start on uh, anti-epileptic drugs or schizophrenia. No, that is not required. That hyperactivity is because of the core feature and because of the excess amount of glutamates and disturbance in the neurotransmitters. Now, in those children, we have given, we have given, and there are many parents in which we are given omega-3 caffeine along with L-theanine. We have found that the results are better. Hyperactivity, aggression, sleep comes out to be better. No, it cannot be treated 100%, but yes, significant improvement we see provided if there's sensory and other parameters are not high, sleeping issues comes out to be better. And if we repeat the testing of EG after one year to eight months, eight to 10 months, the hyperactivity aggression levels come out to be normal. So the importance is that it is not that the child is having seizures, it is the brain hyperactivity which is present because of the disturbance in the alpha, beta and gamma rays, which are the different waves in the brain, which causes the hyperactivity in the brain. And there comes the role of caffeine and L-theanine along with beta. So CNS stimulants, we know that uh, side effects are very, very high. So we generally don't uh, prefer to give them. But yes, in one or two percent of the uh, children where we find that aggression is so much, that we have to give them to some period. So, but the problem is, it's very difficult to wean off them. Cannabis. Now, cannabis is something which is, again, very controversial. It's an opioid. And there are a lot of uh, discussion is now going on on social media about the role of uh, cannabis oil, CBD oil. But uh, its role is very much controversial. And since we have discussed that opioid receptors are there and opioid receptors are the culprits which are causing all aggression of hyperactivity, brain and aggression. So cannabis being an opioid, is uh, very controversial and so it's not recommended as such. Uh, personally, I don't prefer and personally, I have not given a try, but yes, a lot of research is going on, but still risks are high compared to the benefits. So possible medical causes of sleeping issues, as I've discussed, just uh, end up slide to complete. We know that reflux, gut issues, uh, sugars, mitochondrial dysfunctioning, it's just the same candida issues, gut dysbiosis, so whatever we have discussed is just like all the possible things which we have to look into. So uh, you can also, we have given a webinar on sleeping issues in autism. You can go to our YouTube channel. You can see we have discussed all those things. So uh, I have just touched upon the different parameters of biomed to give you an overview. What is basically biomed, how we have to approach because uh, uh, probably many of the parents might be knowing, but many of the parents may not be having exactly what is biomed because biomed is something fancy in, uh, in, uh, in the field of autism, but uh, it's the thing which has to be uh, taken into consideration very meticulously and individualistically depending upon the needs of the child. So uh, this was all about uh, my presentation. So I will take up the questions now. If you have any questions, then we'll directly, otherwise we'll uh, close up the session. Yeah, we will take up the questions now. Uh, hello, sir. Yeah. Uh, can I ask you a question? Yes, yes, ma'am, please. Yeah, actually, uh, very recently, I have seen very uh, behavioral issues in my child. Hmm. My child is uh, 3.10 uh, years old. Okay. So, uh, how to uh, detect or uh, to whom should I consult? That whether it is uh, due to any gut microbacterial uh, uh, disorder, as we discussed. Ma'am, 
and you have to get in touch with a neurodevelopmental pediatrician special who is dealing with biomed who is dealing with gut dysbiosis who who is aware of that and if you are if you are able or you can get in touch with us because we okay, are neuro developmental pediatrician neuro developmental pediatrician who is dealing with yeah yeah okay okay thank you uh there is a question uh, uh i am following gfcf diet and did food intolerance test even so following that also problem is vitamin b12 and vitamin d deficiency can you please advise what should i do now this is what exactly i was telling that uh, just going on a gfcf diet and doing a food intolerance test is uh, not the thing uh, the problem is that there are uh, other things should also be looked into consideration now still the vitamin d deficiency is there probably uh, the amount of dose of vitamin d which might be giving is low the amount of b12 which was giving is low the problem is uh, vitamin b12 and vitamin d deficient now b12 which you are giving probably uh, the uh, the type of b12 which you might be giving may be methyl cobalamin so here we might be giving cyanocobalamin so because the vitamin b12 levels are low in the blood so initially we have to treat the vitamin b12 levels in the blood by giving cyanocobalamin or cyanocobalamin injections which are available in india so then accordingly we have to check for the vitamin d levels what the dose of vitamin d you are giving and what is the dose of vitamin d because vitamin d doses also deficiency varies it may be mild moderate severe or like this so accordingly we have to provide that stuff so uh, yes we yes we are providing online consultations and uh, uh, hello hello sir yeah please ask uh, this is kritika my daughter is 5 years old um uh, throughout the day she is having uh, behavior issues like uh, mostly seeking attention taking the pouring the uh, pouring water on the floor these things only uh, but while uh, listening to your talk i found that her synaptic is good because whatever she is doing she is doing with the, um, the maximum um, optimal thing the best best thing she will do Mm. while taking a thing or uh, doing some action uh, my my next twin uh, my son more than my son who is neurotypical she does every action uh, with with, uh, with like good intelligent intelligence but this behavior issues are uh, uh, predominant throughout the day it is there ah uh, see uh, ma'am you have you have just mentioned the word attention she is basically doing for the attention uh uh whatever behavior the child shows it is only for the four what uh, is only for the four basic things the child shows the behaviors either it may be attention seeking mm -hmm. either it may be due to the sensory issues it may be mm -hmm. due to tangible that is she wants something or it may be due to avoidance or escape mm -hmm. or it may be due to medical causes like gut or anything or the child is not able to express every child will be showing behaviors only on around these parameters now if your child is showing behavior for you while seeking attention you know that for every action there is a reaction if you give him action he will give you a reaction so just don't give him any eye contact just avoid and just show him that you are invisible in front of him okay, okay, okay. whatever command you have to give him just give him once and then just disappear from the scene as though you are not visible and probably you might have seen when you are peeping through the window she will be seeing you if mama is looking she will be doing even more so okay. so yeah so that is exactly the tension seeking with the child wants to see because you are giving him a reaction he will show the action so that is what so just avoid that uh, total avoidance probably those things will resolve uh, uh one more doubt sir whether this is is this related to uh, gut Uh, all these things it could be it could be definitely it could be as we have discussed the uh, the uh, the uh, the incidence is so high so it cannot be told that right now on this 5 minute talk that yes it could yeah. be it is yes or no but yes it definitely it could be yeah but i have seen uh, yeah. if she eats a, a sweet hmm. like a jalebi for one jalebi she will she will do more exactly exactly so that is what i'm telling definitely it would be there but uh, that is what we have discussed in this thing that uh, these are the things which we have to look upon so it would be there definitely okay so thank thank you so much yeah thank you i would request uh, to ask the questions directly so that it becomes easier for me also yeah. it will be better if we can talk face to face 
any other question please yeah hello sir yeah. Uh, this is shweta yeah please so i just uh, want to know i mean a few days my son is like off or for example today he is not behave, i mean he is not listening to whatever we are saying or he will be doing opposite of it mm. if yes he if he'll say like close your mouth he'll open his mouth mm. and anything i mean if you don't do this then he'll do this mm. but a uh, few days are like very bright days when he'll uh, do everything very nicely and uh, he'll uh, you know uh, do everything properly whatever we'll say he'll uh, do that okay uh, so okay. i mean uh, maybe kind of some kind of gut issues uh, and he, he has uh, uh, constipation issues uh, so we consulted one journal uh, physician about his uh, i mean this constipation issue mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so maybe i mean uh, something is related exactly. to exactly exactly yes exactly uh, as i was telling in the presentation that there will be periods of waxing and waning initially there will be very good days and there will be very bad days and you might have poor you might have seen also when that gut is disturbed the constipation happens mm -hmm. his behavioral issues get shoot up okay. okay so that is directly what we were discussing about the gut dysbiosis so now giving some laxatives probably what your uh, doctor might have given you that yeah, will yeah. only yeah laxatives will not help to resolve it will only help to transiently resolve that solution because he will mm -hmm. pass the stools for 5 to 6 days through laxatives and maybe lose his gut maybe better but again the similar problem will happen so we have to mm -hmm. work on the gut dysbiosis so exactly yes the problem is uh, his gut if it is gut is better if he gets gets uh, gut gets better then definitely mm -hmm. those issues will also settle down so uh, for that bottle test uh, we should go for uh that, that's again i have told you it's very individualistic ma'am we i cannot tell you that uh, generally that okay you go for this test okay. it's very individualistic but yet one mandatory uh, test is one food intolerance but uh, mm -hmm. along with food intolerance you will not get an idea of gut uh, gut dysbiosis that has to be done in dependence upon taking into the history of other things if you want to know the details or if you want to get you can get in touch with that but yes a one food intolerance is mandatory which will give you an idea about the mm -hmm. intolerance factors and that will be done from lalpath lalpath or... or srl or thyrocare okay food intolerance okay sir thank okay. you thank you hello hello uh, uh, can you hear me yeah please ha huh. yeah i am dr ruma de yeah, actually uh, the my child he is not he is no, no longer a kid he is a adult of 28 years of age okay. now my question is would gfcf diet see when he was a kid at mm -hmm. that point of time gfcf diet did not really at least yeah. in india in kolkata it really mm -hmm. did uh, we did not know much about it mm -hmm. but uh, after hearing from some of my friends so i had given a trial mm -hmm. of gfcf diet mm -hmm. uh, for 6 months Okay. but it really did not work much okay and my son was is very fond of milk and it was really difficult for him and in kolkata it is also very difficult at that point of time it was very difficult to get casein free milk hmm. so uh, so he is on he is no, no longer on gfc diet and uh, the problem with him is uh, he is verbal He, he understands very well that attention seeking problem is still there with him mm. now uh, as you have said cisodon i have to give him cisodon one mg only mm. even at the age of 28 years mm. i give him one respiratory one mg at night mm. and along with that gaba i give him tds mm. gaba tds mm. and now what he complains is that, that attention seeking problem is there i understand and mm. he, what uh, along with that uh, you know he at times when he gets stressed he has sleep problems besides okay. that uh, you know that uh, he blabbers too much you know self talking is there too much mm -hmm. now self talking is really causing a lot of problem do you mm -hmm. think that self talking can be uh, somehow modified with this biomedics biomedical see, treatment see, uh, see 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 ma'am the thing is uh, the first of all the thing is uh, he's 28 years yeah. so definitely the results will not be that much uh, yeah right uh, right beneficial or that much successful but mm. yes uncontrolled laughter as uh, self talking sleep mm. disturbances could be due to gut dysbiosis maybe because of the yeast overgrowth issues or the fungal mm. issues other thing you had mm. tried gfcf diet did you go for a food intolerance test No, no, no. At that no. point of so you you didn't go. So probably uh, you. But 
just uh, sorry, I'm interrupting. You know, at that point of time, when he was see uh, four or five years of age, he had a lot of uh, you know gut issues. Like he had often he had diarrhea and uh, at times constipation. But these things are no longer there. You no. Know? Exactly. Exactly. These so these things that's are a, no longer there. Exactly. So right now there is no point in starting a GFCF diet. Right. At right. this stage, there is no point in starting a GFCF diet. Even if you want to give it a trial, it would be advisable to go for a, a food intolerance test. At least you get to know an idea what is intolerance. Probably during that period of time, during this whole journey of spectrum, he might mm -hmm. his gut might have been uh, adapted to the changes. Adapted. Uh, yeah. yeah. So this is something which, this is something which gets keep on uh, changing during the period. It doesn't mean if you have an intolerance today, the next after two years or three years, it will be remaining the same. It might get adapted okay. or you might follow it. It might gradually mm -hmm. resolve it. Okay. And so, one point in your talk interested, I found interest is that uh, vitamin B12, methylcobalamin. Yeah. Do you yeah. think uh, I, I can give him exactly, a Exactly. Exactly. Yes. Yes. I was about to tell you that uh, my suggestion would be not to give GABA. My suggestion would be to give methylcobalamin, the B12, oral uh, tablets which are available, methylcobalamin. Huh. And, and for what your, will be the dose for it? It will be the adult dose, 1500 MCG. 1500 MCG. Yeah, okay. uh, one single dose. Yeah, one, one single, single dose. Yeah, that can single. be given at any time of the day. Isn't yeah, it? that can be given, but make sure be in touch with any uh, doctor at your place who is in dealing with these neurotypical uh, disorders so that you can mm -hmm. in touch with the doctor. Or either since you are yourself is a doctor, so just mm -hmm. be in a touch with uh, anybody who is... Uh, having an idea about that but the it would be can i get in touch with, with you can i get in touch with you you, you can you can get in touch with us you can get in touch with us uh, then where okay. how do i do it uh, we will uh, we will share uh, you uh, we will share you the email id and okay. also the clinic number you can get in touch mm -hmm. with us okay uh, the whatsapp and group which we have created for today mm -hmm. we'll share the details in that okay and okay. Uh, right now you you advise me to Start uh, with hyalcobalamin, right? A B12, you can give 15, that. 15 microgram. 1500. Right. 1500. Okay, 1500. Sorry. So, uh, yeah. Thank, so, you. thank you. Uh, we'll thank, be taking so up, thank you. We'll be taking up the last question now. Please, as already we are uh, way past nine. So, any last, any other question, please? Doctor, can you hear me? Yes, please. Uh, can you, uh, uh, you just mentioned uh, vitamin B. 12 methyl cobalin. Can yes. you give me a name for the medicine to buy? Methyl cobalamin. Methyl cobalamin is the name of the medicine. Okay. Why do we give vitamin B6? Vitamin B6, that is what I'm telling. Vitamin B6, we have not discussed here. Vitamin B6, again, is a factor which is, plays an important role for the actor as a coenzyme for various other roles. Since high dose of vitamin, it's not that only B6. We have to give a high dose of B6. But again, giving a high dose of B6 is not that much beneficial when compared to giving a B12. But B6 we generally give in a high dose, again, for the mitochondrial smooth function. Okay. Can you okay. Uh, give me a name of a nutritional supplement which has all the vitamins? <clears throat> See, uh, nutritional supplement, all the vitamins, you will get so many in the market. They are zinc weight, They are uh, A to Z. So many are available. But the problem is... It's not that the which contains all the vitamins. The pro, the important thing is the dose of B12. Yes. Okay, the dose of B12 which is required. Is, for the nutritional supplement, we can give any zinc weight, we can give any multivitamin A to Z, but that won't be uh, that won't prove the benefit which is required through this. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Fifteen hundred mg for an adult, you said. See, uh, that's uh, yeah. But again, I'm telling, don't take it as a generalized thing. Because as yes. I have told, it has to be individualized from child to child. Okay. He's okay. not a child, doctor. He's no. 45. I mean to say individualized from person to person. Okay, doctor. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So we'll uh, closing up the session for today. Thank you. Uh, uh, sir, sir, can I ask one question only? Okay. Okay, ma'am. We'll take up the last question now. Uh, sir, I just want to know that how long we have to continue this biomed with at least, case. at least, ma'am, at least minimum period of eight to ten months. After but that, you, we can stop it. After that, it's not that we have to stop. We will gradually make the child towards a more and more to a normal diet. Okay. Okay. We okay. are giving here. We are following some restricted diet. We are following some nutrition. So gradually, gradually, we'll move to a normal diet, a normal neurotypical pattern of food and diet. So, but that has to be a uh, minimum period is eight to ten months. 
but before that you will be doing some testing with the kid that yeah. is required that yeah. biomedical yeah. testing we will be doing the de- there will be a detailed developmental history of the child with the parents there will be the videos of the child will also be shared so that we get to know the clinical picture of the child we will be there will be assessment forms have to be done some basic tests will be done depending upon the clinical picture the developmental history the videos of the child and then a plan will be formulated okay okay, okay. okay. thank you sir thank you doctor thank you thank you May I say something, doctor? Yes, please. Thank you very much for the session. I learned a lot. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.